So our, our, our next um, presenter is Philip Gonzaga. What we're doing here tonight is, as we have done in the past, trying to give you a little bit of background first on the, on the science, what we know. And um, I just want to know, with the Spanish influenza um, in 1918, right after World War I, they didn't have any vaccinations for the men. It ended, right? They didn't vaccinate people. What ended the Spanish influenza? All the people who got infected either died or recovered. But they didn't vaccinate people. They didn't give them some No, that's drugs. why so many died. So many died, but then it was over. It didn't keep going on. And but they, they didn't vaccinate. Did they vaccinate people? They, they had sulfur drug vaccine. ambulance for secondary infections. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So they well, did not vaccinate people. people. Okay. So anyway, so what we're going to do next is um, we were really fortunate to have Philip son who's at UCSD, is really fortunate to have him as well, who has been very interested in in trying to figure out how best to respond to crises that might occur, and he's going to take his talents today and apply them specifically to pandemic questions. Thanks, so, <clears throat> Francesca talked about the science, and there were three topics here, science, ethics, and uncertainty, and I'm the last speaker. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the uncertainty, and I want to tell a story, if I can figure out how to work a computer. Uh, okay. So in December of 1929, can you hear me? Okay. Well, then I must speak louder because you're in the front row and my wife. Um, so in December of 1929, Simon Martin bought a parrot as a Christmas gift for his wife from a pet shop in Baltimore, Maryland. Hoping to surprise his wife, he asked his daughter and son-in-law to take the, the care of the bird until Christmas. By Christmas, the parrot had died and Mr. Martin's wife, daughter, and son-in-law had become very ill. A local doctor who had recently read an article on something called parrot fever examined the Martins. After his exams, the doctor sent a telegram to the U.S. Public Health Service which read, please supply parrot fever serum our disposal immediately. The only problem was there wasn't a serum and there wasn't any treatment. When the mayor of Baltimore was advised about the situation, he alerted the governor. Someone also called the newspaper. Imagine that. Stories conflicted on the severity of the virus. Does this sound familiar? Right? On January 15th, the New York Times reported 50 cases of parrot fever in the United States, including seven deaths. Over time, more was learned about the nature of the virus. And less than two weeks after the initial outbreak, essentially the newspapers were reporting that the story was overblown. Well, they were also the ones reporting the story in the beginning. Uh, which is interesting. One newspaper in jest wrote that uh, the Secretary of State at the time, Henry Stimson, had a parrot that was locked up in the basement, not because it had parrot fever, but because it had a habit of swearing. So just when it seemed parrot fever was a national joke, two of the leading medical officers who were handling this case, and specifically the sick parrots, died. All of a sudden, it's not a joke again, and it's very serious. What does this story tell us? Anyone? Okay, first of all, I think it tells us that history repeats itself, right? Um, in this case, we had experience. They knew about uh, flu virus in animals. They knew something about this, but there were assumptions, and you have to check those assumptions with the science, and it's evolving. And as it evolves, you try to get ahead of it with good science, and that's very difficult to do in an evolving event. And I think it also points to the difficulty of discerning and making good decisions in the, in the heat of the moment, so to speak. So I want to focus on that process, how to make good decisions in the heat of the moment and what we've learned from the past events. Um, you've already seen this once before. I'm going to read it because the screen is fairly washed out. I'll pull the mic over here. It says, as the two friends wandered through the snow on their way home, Piglet grinned to himself, thinking how lucky he was to have a best friend like Pooh. Pooh thought to himself, if the pig sneezes, he's dead. So the, the point here, my daughter thought that was funny. She's six. So um, maybe that points to her sense of humor. But in any event, um, no plant survives first contact with the enemy. 
All right, so we had plants that were based on bird flu from Asia, right? And we got swine flu from Mexico. It doesn't mean that the planning process or the media are necessarily bad. It means that you need to be very flexible and you have to assume that there are going to be a lot of uh, missteps initially, okay? Assumptions based on the data at hand that will have to be adjusted. And that does not disparage anyone in the process. It doesn't mean that anyone is doing this uh, for some uh, malicious reason. It's a matter of the process. Um, during this crisis, people said, you know, the WHO just raised the level. Breaking news, the WHO goes from four to five. What does that mean? It means very little. If you're in San Diego County and the WHO goes from level four to five, it really doesn't change that much for you. It changes when we have a case or a fatality ratio that changes, okay, locally. So when we look at these things, we have to look at what's happening globally and make that real for us. And interestingly, in this case, there was quite a bit of different views as to exactly what to do. If you remember, the vice president said, gee, if it was my family, I wouldn't get on a plane. Um, some people said you should close the border, <laughs> right? They are finally a delayed reaction to the, to the joke, you know. Um, it wasn't the slide you're laughing at, though. So in any event, um, there are differing views at differing levels about what to do. And we should just accept that that's going to be part of the dialogue. That's why they call it a crisis, right? So our goal, then, is to make good decisions in this environment. All right? And the first is to understand what the environment is, which is that incomplete information comes in, has not been vetted yet. And vetted by that, I mean it has met the test of science. Okay? Someone says, I validated this. This is uh, I can prove this. Okay, that's very difficult to do. The other is there's a false sense that if we have a plan, then we must be more safe um, than if we didn't. Okay, in some cases that's true. We had a lot of good ideas. The idea is that you need to be very flexible with that. And third, there are some that believe, well, if I have a plan, then as long as I implement it, things will move according to my plan. Right? And I think I've disabused you, hopefully, by the story of 1930, that that's not always the case. In fact, most of the time, that isn't the case. The other is the myth of panic. I don't know if you've heard this word in the media, but they'll say, there is no panic on the streets. Well, why are you introducing the idea of panic? Right? In fact, panic is very rare. So it's not panic for someone to be concerned. I think what we want is to make sure there's not aberrant behavior. Right? By aberrant behavior, we mean that I see someone with a mask on, and I'm wondering, do you know more than I do? Why are you wearing a mask? Who told you to wear a mask? Right? And if that becomes an issue where it's not prudent at that point to wear a mask, then we can change behavior for the negative. We could run out of masks, because everybody wants a mask. Right? Or everyone wants Tamiflu. Just because they've heard that brand name, they have no idea what it's going to do, but they've heard Tamiflu, so I must need it. And that might sound, again, in jest, but in fact, there were people who thought they should have a food. This is predictable. Okay, every one of the things that I've just said are predictable. We know they, are, they will occur. There's, there's recent history that we forget, and there's you know, history back to the 1930s and beyond that uh, we know. There's another um, part of this that I'd like to talk about, and it's the, the three elements on here. I borrowed this from a friend of mine, Harvard, and I should give him credit, he wrote a book by the same title, Predictable Surprises. It's available on Amazon.com, you can get a discount. Max is a great guy, he allowed me to use this list here. I've added three things to it that are completely washed out because of the screen, so uh, forgive me. They are fantasy plans, that is believing that the event will follow some predetermined notion that you put together in your head. Um, the other is blame phase, okay? The fact is that we will constantly search for someone or some organization to blame. In some cases, it's just not there, okay? It just doesn't occur. And in other cases, it takes a long time to figure out who, and it could be not WHO, but who, the person. And then in some cases, it could be multiple layers of blame that can be assigned, right? And ultimately, there's bias in our decisions. When we make decisions in the heat of the moment, we don't have all the, the best information. We've got to make some uh, level of uh, incomplete decision-making. 
This um, just shows John Stewart really ripping FEMA during Hurricane Katrina. And what he's saying here is he just lifted their chart off their webpage, which said that they start and end in a disaster. And he said, so they did exactly what they say they're going to do. Why is anybody surprised? Um, but there are some serious uh, errors that occur when the media portrays the response in these types of life. And I'm not trying to support FEMA or anything like that. There are plenty of uh, areas to blame in that event. But in most cases, there is a certain predisposition to assign blame very quickly before we even know what's happening. So, you know, awareness and experience are important. Um, they're necessary, they're not always sufficient. We need more than just awareness and experience about the event. <clears throat> a couple of uh, factors that I'd like to point to, and I'm probably running through this a little bit quick. I'm originally from New Jersey, so when I came to California, I thought everybody moved really slow, they talked really slow, right? So excuse me if I'm, if I'm going real fast, plus I had too much coffee. Um, so, you know, there's a certain perceptional bias. If it's not, it's only a minor heart attack if it's someone else's, right? I mean, this initially was a problem in Mexico. And until it became our problem here, it was, I wonder what's happening in Mexico, right? All of a sudden, it's in San Diego, and it's a completely different dynamic, right? And the media responded to that. It became breaking news, right? WHO level changes, breaking news, one case. Uh, breaking news, suspected case, the threshold went up, it went down, eventually it went away. It doesn't mean that the cases went away, it just meant they went on to another subject. Um, there's also a, a neglect of um, the probability, right? If it's a novel case and all of a sudden this occurs, we forget that 30,000 people die of seasonal flu every year. That's, that's a really amazing statistic. So, you know, in terms of probability, it's more dangerous to drive your car here in this presentation, right? And you probably all attest to that. The other is we have a certain bias towards information that has been provided over and over again, right? If I repeat something, even if it's wrong, you've heard it so many times, there must be something to it. It must be true, right? It's not always the case, but we do search for confirming data. This was... Um, let me see the date on this. Now, this was December of 2001, so shortly after you know, September 11th. And it's not just talking about what happened with terrorism, but it's talking about all things. And again, this is a little washed out, but it says German chemical warfare, suicide bombers, nuclear weapons, a jittery nation needs to separate reality from rumor. Here are the facts, plus the hunt for bin Laden. No Thank you for the balance. Okay. So we know, right, when something like this happens, there is not so much panic, but there's concern. And that's shaped in the way that the information is presented. So, you know, we've had a chance to speak to the local media and talk to them about that. And they're, I think, very sensitive to that. Um, they're also up against other forces uh, like ratings. Okay. You know, when you can break a story, even if the story's already been presented, but it's breaking news, it changes the, the dynamic of that. This has nothing to do with pandemic flu, but it's an example, I think, a tragic example of how this goes wrong, okay? During the Virginia Tech tragedy, there was media reporting while the event was unfolding, live images of the response, and there were experts, okay, I, I shouldn't put the air quotes around that, but experts, who said there was absolutely no security on that campus. Does anybody believe that was true? Absolutely no security? I mean, they had their own police force. The buildings had locks. They actually talked to the students about what to do if there was an event like this. They're a nationally accredited law enforcement agency. Okay? But the um, reaction to this was that the national media showed up at Virginia Tech and they asked students, while they were still grieving, don't you blame the university? This is kind of a loaded leading question, okay? So this is a dynamic that as uh, citizens, we need to kind of adjust to. And, and I think part of that challenge is to wait for the facts, okay? And think about where we put that in regard to the information that's presented. Again, not so much related to pandemic flu, but just crisis dynamics. 
This was a cartoon that appeared in the student newspaper at UC San Diego following the Virginia Tech shootings. So we did a number of things on the campus. Uh, we conducted an exercise. We tried to simulate how we would respond to such an event. We had an open forum with the students, just like this meeting, where we said, tell us what you're thinking. We talked to them about psychological counseling services, and just in general, be aware of your surroundings. You know, this should happen again here. And a certain segment of the student population felt we were doing too much. We were kind of pushing this issue too much. After Northern Illinois University had a shooting, it completely changed. Okay, so the latency between that and, and the next shooting really changed the dynamic. And what does this mean to our preparations for the pandemic flu? What you want, I think, is confidence. Right? You want people that are looking at these issues and they're trying to discern what's happening and giving you the best possible advice on what to do. Okay? So in this case, the CDC did, I think, a good job of trying to discern what was happening here. You've got another nation involved. You've got the World Health Organization involved. Completely different constituencies. You have a public health officer who's trying to discern what's happening right here in San Diego. And they're all trying to figure this out while things are evolving. Okay, so it's, I think Mike and I were talking about this. It's easy to point and look and say, boy, they really didn't seem to have their acts together, so to speak, right? But in fact, they were all really trying to look at this issue from different perspectives and do the best they could with fragmented information. So it's really not so much the access to information, right? We have information overload in some cases. It's just 24-7 news cycle. Um, it's more discerning what exactly it is that we're supposed to do. What's the most prudent step that you can take? And I think we're very fortunate here in San Diego that you have the two medical centers, Thornton and Hillcrest. There's a lot of good information here in this local community about what to do in the event of uh, another event like this, okay? So, you know, in certain regards, we're really blessed in that, in that uh, perspective. Here's just a few things that we as um, crisis managers think about, okay? First, we want some fast and frugal decision making that we practice. So we want to carry something, literally on our person. I have a checklist I carry, it's got 20 items on it. Essentially it says, what's happened? What are we doing about it? Where do we think this is going? Okay, I want to project out um, 42, uh, 72 hours, whatever. Where is this going? Right, is it better or worse the same? If it's worse, what are we doing to get ahead of it? Okay, that's, I think, what you want. Um, the other is, and, and you should think about that on a personal level. Right now, you have this window of opportunity to think about what you can do. We do nothing but talk to our children about hand washing. We've just made an incredible difference in seasonal flu. We just talk to our kids because they're coming into contact with other kids, and that's you know usually a pretty interesting environment for virus. Okay, I've watched my daughter wash her hands. I have to ask her every single time. It feels like it's a deposition. But eventually she does do it, okay? So they do learn from that, and that's one thing we can do to make a difference. The other is just being aware of that dynamic, that it will not be perfect, okay? That we will have um, some information that might not seem right initially, and it'll need to be cleaned up as the process goes. And it's always helpful for you to gain out on an individual level what you would do. Okay, beyond just the preventative measures, thinking about what you would do beyond this scenario, like earthquake or fire. We're entering into fire, we're actually already in fire season, right? So, you know, thinking about this from a broader perspective in terms of what do you think you ought to do uh, before something occurs, that provides you with an advantage. Okay, you start to kind of um, forecast your response. Here's one other thing you can do. Anyone here in, uh, in a large organization? Just raise your hand if you work for a large organization. No? Uh, oh, okay. Two, three, four. Do I get five? No? Okay. Four. All right. So there are basically three things we know from past events, right? Every, and you're going to want to know this beforehand. So if you're involved in a big organization, you can put this ahead of, you can basically develop this before an event occurs, all right? This is based on research uh, by Vince Cabello, who advised the uh, mayor's office in New York. 
So Rudy Giuliani used a message map prior to September 11th. And when the event occurred, here's what he did. He wanted to know, and he had already formatted, what are the three things that, I, that people want to know about this event. Most cases, it's going to be, how severe is this? What does it mean to me? And what's going to happen next? Okay, Every single time. What are the three things that you want people to know? Okay, They might be the same, or they might be different. It, it all depends on the situation, but in most cases, there's three things you want people to know, and one of them is not, don't panic, okay? I love when people tell me, calm down, you know, because it only excites me more. But in any event, and then what are three things people are going to get wrong, right? And a lot of times what we're going to get wrong is, who's to blame, right? Tell me who I can get mad at right now, and we just don't know that. And it really isn't that helpful initially, okay? Because we're trying to focus on fixing things. So it can actually be counterproductive. And again, the example of Virginia Tech. Imagine those students who were there, who had already experienced this tragedy being asked, do you blame the university? Imagine how that re-traumatizes someone, okay? To search for, for blame initially. Does anybody know who um, made this quote? Jan Spavers, The Prepared Mind. There's some microbiologists in here, right? Come on. Louis Pasteur. Louis Pasteur. Yeah, Louis Pasteur. So um, the other quote, though, is from the captain of the Titanic. And I'd what say... What was the quote of Pasteur? Jan Spavers, The Prepared Mind. Thank you. Yeah. Not my slide. The other, though, is from the uh, captain of the Titanic. And it's just the position. And he says, when anyone asks me, well, this was obviously before, you know, what happened. Um, how I can best describe my nearly 40 years at sea, I merely say, uneventful. Uh -oh. Okay, pop that, that's a good response. Uh -oh. <laughs> I don't want to hear that from somebody who's in charge of a ship, right? That's an uh-oh moment. So uh, that was a perfect response. Um, so essentially, you know, the message here is, uh, first of all, this is a shameless plug. We have a class at uh, UC San Diego, and I'm pitching it today. It's that we talk about all these types of scenarios in November. Hopefully there won't be fires in October and you know, things will be brighter. But in any event, two days at UC San Diego, you would have a great time. Um, so essentially what I wanted to do is give you a little bit of insight into the process and how you know, crisis managers look at these events and try to make good informed decisions and then give guidance. And hopefully I've accomplished that call. I appreciate your time very much. Thank you. I think we should do now, then we can have, have Francesca come up as well, and uh, we'll just take these two chairs, and then uh, we can have a conversation involving all of you. Um, we have questions for you if you don't have questions for our panelists. So, uh, we do this. Sense for an ethics discussion, we probably want to look to.